When your child is born, you work hard to provide for all their needs and hope that they will live long and healthy lives that will allow them to achieve all they put their mind to achieve. You try your best to teach them about life and show them the paths they must take to be safe and pray they heed what you have told them. Unfortunately, at times, that is not enough. I'm Joe. Some may say, some call it Joseph, it's Joe Joseph. Uh, and I've been around and about and some, somewhere I learned how to smoke drugs. Joe Ivale started taking drugs in 1985. At that time, he was still in senior four at St. Mary's College, Chisubi. For 25 years, Joe has had run-ins with police and confrontations with family members because of drug abuse. He is now 45 years old and on the path of recovery from drugs. However, the scars of his disease are still very much apparent in his life. At first, we didn't realize he was taking drugs, but normally he used to be very quiet. But he, after, in AS secondary school, he started dancing, break dancing, and he was wondering. He was not shy anymore, so he was wondering. So I, di I didn't realize it at, at the time. You know, those days, break dance had, had just come, so we used to dance, break dance together. So when we'd, watch, when we'd go to practice dancing, he taught me how to smoke as we were practicing dancing. At, at school, so we'd go to class after class, we'd get in our clique and go and smoke and come back to the rest of the guys when we were high. We realized it more when after his S4, because he didn't perform to our expectations, because he was very clever. He didn't do very badly, just got us uh, and a second grade. Mm. So we tried to talk to him, encourage him to study, but... Um, we used to have a place outside school. So we'd, we pretend we were going at the back to, to the field, then we'd sneak past the field, go get the drugs and come back with them inside. So no one would know we are out and in. Joe eventually ran away from school after a confrontation with the headmaster and didn't get to finish his senior five or six. At this point, one might conclude that Joe probably has a poor family background, one laced with poverty and illiteracy. However, Joe's father was an engineer and a cricket player, Joe's mother a teacher, and they lived in Tinda, one of the highly esteemed residential areas in Kampala. But Joe preferred a life in the Kamocha ghettos with his friends. You wonder what is happening, what is going to happen to him. He behaved like a crazy person most times. He would do, when he didn't have money, he would do, take things and sell them. His own clothes, even some people, some things in the house. After dropping out of school, I was mostly a thief sometimes, you know. Sometimes we'd get clean money, but sometimes, most of the time, we'd steal pickpockets. Sometimes I'd go to the disco. Sometimes I'd, I'd get a work making money in the disco, which would maintain my what, my job what. I used to know how to make money in a disco. So that's, that's what maintained my habit most of the time. Sometimes he would be arrested with his, a group of his friends. Then you have to go and, uh, you know, take someone to help him get him out. Mm. It was a lot, of, a lot of stress, a lot of stress indeed. Joe tried making an honest living, but in vain. I used to work in some construction company. I had no qualifications, so I used to work as a storekeeper, keeping this, looking after the store. And by this time, were you still using drugs? Yeah, I would, yeah, I would even smoke on the job. So how did this affect your work and relationship? I, I, 
I left work again and went back to hang out with my friends in the ghetto because I was used to making money in the disco. So I used to feel these other jobs are boring because I used to know how to make money in a disco. Any person who's using a drug knows that a drug, they know the effects, the effects are there, you get. But they tend to deny that those effects, it's not the time for them to have those effects. They deny they don't have the effects. For them, they are looking at the good thing that they feel is coming from that. Confidence, you, you become super when you use it, you can do whatever you want. When you have low self-esteem, you can do, you can speak. So they always concentrate on the good things they get from the drug. And now, when a person concentrates on something, a good thing from a drug, it's very hard for this person to come in terms that there are other sides of the effects. Even when he's, he has started getting um, drug induced psychosis, when he gets better, he will say, mm -mm, yeah, I used to, I think I'm not mad. I use it to smoke when I'm eating well. Those ones who get mad are those ones who don't eat. You get it. So sometimes we try harder to make sure that we cut this chain of having that wrong thinking. When we are in rehab, they taught us how to think, to recognize, think of the, recognize the good feelings, then you compare them to the bad feelings. So when I, used, when I think of the good feelings I used to get, I, 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 then I, I also think of the bad feelings. When I start thinking of the bad feelings, it helps me that these bad feelings of going to jail, you have to disturb people to get you out of jail. When I think of those things, I forget about the good feelings. The scourge of drug abuse does not only affect the individual. Family relationships suffer as drug addicts, take center stage, and the violent effects take their toll on the family. At times, the abuse of drugs by one child will lead to others in the family adopting the same habit. Joe is the firstborn in a family of four children. It did influence his other brother and his cousin who was living with us. In fact, the cousin who went abroad got completely messed up. Even up to now, he hasn't recovered. He was older than us, he was stronger than us, so we couldn't do anything. And he had a gang of friends who were rowdy. Guys would look up to you, they call you Rasta, what? These guys would admire you for being one of them or something like that. When a person takes a drug, this drug alters the brain, you get it. So when you talk about altering the brain, it means the person's thinking changes. For example, if someone takes weed, and it, it, it changes someone's perception, weed is marijuana. If something is big, it tends to become small. That's why I see that someone can climb a big tree, and then when he looks down, the place has become near him. So he can try to jump down and then the onlookers will see that someone has got an injury but to him it is his safe. Many parents would ask themselves, where did I go wrong? But there are a number of influences outside the home that would get anyone to start using drugs. For Joe, it was his friends and the Rastafari life he adopted. So, how do you tell your child is going down that road? When you look at a husband and you look at someone who's going to school, they are all different. How would you detect that a person that you are living with is using a drug? First of all, his behavior will start changing. A person can start to become isolated. You used to eat on the same table, but he starts eating alone. Picks food and goes to the, to the room and eats alone. He cannot associate with the family members, can become, start becoming aggressive, can start becoming too violent, start ignoring the core things that human beings are supposed to have. Bathing, he cannot bathe, doesn't know how places are supposed to be washed, leaving them anywhere, you, you get it. Eh? Those are some kind of signs arrogant and he doesn't listen when you talk to him he talks back and he quarrels but there are those ones who are stubborn 
you can know that this is age, but this a drug is different. However, a drug. How would you differentiate them to hmm? know that you know this is not adolescence, this hmm. is a drug? Because now you will start seeing someone becoming maybe thin, he doesn't eat or he's eating too much, eating disorders. You get? Yeah. When he gets up, he's something, someone different. He's becoming bony, the eyes have sunk, he's really changing. Yet this person, the adolescence, is, his body is built up well. Though he, you can tell him to do this and he's distracted, he doesn't do it. But this one is totally different. However, drugs work with behavior. So you can command a drug to do what you want. If you want to steal, you can smoke and say, let me look for money power to go and jump there. So you can do it. You stayed up everybody's bedroom, the sitting room, sweep around, very, very spotless clean. Unlike he, now, now he's not as, as he used to be. I think that is the effect of drugs that makes him lose that. The eyes, when you look at the person's eyes, they become like tea-like. And then this eyeball will get out and then this thing will enter inside. And then you can also look at the heartbeat. Even the sweating, someone sweats too, too much. The hands, eh? Even when you look at the person, sometimes doesn't concentrate into your eyes. You can know that this, there is a problem going on. Yeah. Oh, he becomes too much excited. Too much excited. But when he has not taken, he's quite cool. Eh? And he, once they're addicted, it's not easy to, you know, to stop. So it is better if somebody can suspect early and try to do something about it. Over the years, there has been an increment in drug-related crime. Thousands of cases are reported by police. Ugandans are now consuming more heroin and cocaine, which are Class A drugs, the hardcore drugs. However, when a person is arrested with contrabands, he or she is fined 1 million shillings in court upon conviction, which isn't much. And at the moment, there is no specific law for narcotics. Narcotics and Psychotic Substances Control Bill, which was proposed in 2007, is yet to be passed. So what help remains for the communities and families that have been ravaged by drugs? Yeah, we took him to Tavika Hospital. The first time we took him there, he escaped. Yeah. He escaped from Tavika? Definitely, he escaped the first time we took him there. He escaped. The following day, he was back home. Yeah. But that time there, there wasn't this um, a, ADU, alcohol and drug um, unit, it was not there. So he used to go to the mental hospital because he, he became mental actually. So we took him to the mental hospital. I don't know whether it was good for him to be there, but that's what we did. Okay, so mm. you didn't find any other institute that could help him? Not at the time, not at the time. Later on, we took him to Serenity Center. After, after yes, long after Tavika, we took him to Serenity Center. He was there for quite a while, but every time he comes back, he would go back to, to the drugs. After some time of stabilization, then he would go back. Mutavika National Referral Hospital is a mental health national referral hospital for the entire country's estimated population of 32 million in 2010. In the newly constructed drugs and alcohol unit, an estimated 300 patients are treated in a month, though with a few beds, only the very critical are admitted. But the problem of drug abuse doesn't stop in the drugs unit. Many in the mental wards are mental because of drug abuse. So with weak laws, an overwhelmed hospital, and stigma in the community, drug patients suffer in silence with their families. We, we try our best, um, helping them psychologically as in behavior changes concerned so that they can quit, how they can deal with their addictions. But the challenges we find is that today you help a person after maybe three months, two months, and the person goes back to the same thing. It's really so challenging because sometimes you, you don't know what to do next. 
But because we know that addiction is a disease, it's a progressive disease, it's a relapsing disease, we make sure that when they come back, we start afresh. So we don't ignore them as in because he was here and then I, I can't handle. Because being a relapsing disease, we make sure that we start maybe from where they started or from looking at the, um, the problems that has triggered the relapse. Good afternoon, Mommy. Good afternoon, Chris. I'm very fine, thank you. Yeah, thank you for welcoming me again. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, I'm back here. Last time we had a session with Joe, yes. and we are progressing on very, very well. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, Joe has been with me, as we are saying. We've been having uh, uh, several sessions with him, mm -hmm. and there's a very good progress being uh, done. Yes. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we discussed on several steps of uh, progress and possibly how to achieve the goals. Uh, Joe told me he has been home and taking care of home. And then I said we need to involve in uh, also mommy and see how can we really deal with this. You know his problem, he has been home. Yeah, he's been home. Yeah. I, I wish you'd find something to do. Oh, yeah. But he always says he wants to look after home. Mm. We send him on errands. Mm. 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 Okay. Can you tell me, uh, since we st I started meeting him, possibly to monitor the progress, how do you think Joe has improved? He has changed now oh, that oh, he nice. has uh, stopped, stopped taking drugs for a while. Oh, nice. And um, the only problem is still smoking. Oh, yeah, yeah. The cigarettes. The cigarettes. I wish you'd also deal with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you can I say he's smoking the cigarettes now? Taking some? Yes, cigarettes? he does. Okay. Mm. But the marijuana? I haven't noticed. Oh, okay. Yet, yeah. mm. Mm. What about the behavior? Because I remember when I met him, the day I fir he first introduced me to this family, he would sit uh, outside very, very isolated, mm. in depression, with a lot of dreadlocks, and really uh, on a mattress outside there. It mm. was really miserable. Yeah, now he has uh, changed the place. He sits with us in the sitting room. Okay, oh, nice. Mm. Okay. He plays his music. Yeah. That's what ah. he loves most. Ah, Joe, thank you for that. Eh? So he plays his music? Yeah, he plays his music. Okay. You send him on errands. He's the one who is in charge of the finances when I'm not around. Oh, that's incredible. He's very trustworthy now. Sure. Very nice. trustworthy. I congratulate you for that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 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 Okay. So we can register some. For Joe, it has been the love and support of his family that has seen him to recovery. The evil is realized the problem Joe had and made a decision to get him help. But many are suffering in silence, and worse still, victims are treated with stigma in their societies. However, the medical workers emphasize a person's reintegration in society as one of the key steps in the recovery process. The role that uh, society or parents must um, the effort they must put in is to understand, actually, that these people are not like us anymore. They are not like us. They are sick. We don't say that it's a physical sickness, but it's a psychological sickness. Meaning that anything small can trigger this, this feeling, and someone tells himself that those days I used to chill this problem with a drug. And if he's going in a system of, of sobriety, it becomes hard for him if he meets those challenges to, to keep up with the pace of seeing real, real life. Coping with it becomes a problem. So what the set has to know is that these people, they are real vulnerable to anything. And so they can relapse. So if they relapse, as any other disease, if someone has diabetes, someone has a hypertension, and there is an attack, you bring back the person to the doctor. So the same applies to these addicts. If there is a relapse, a person should be brought back to the hospital for treatment, for more management. Uganda is number one in Africa for alcohol intake and eighth globally ahead of Germany and Australia 
at positions 9 and 10, respectively. What many don't realize is that alcoholism is a gateway to other substance abuse, so the problem of drug abuse is stemmed in our culture as a drinking nation. Joe is among the few who have been lucky to survive their life, but the 25 years he lost and Uganda lost, having him as a contributing member of society cannot be salvaged. Speak out now before it is too late. Anything Say anything, Mr. Demat, we don't. Say Rabadam, eh. Say Rabadam, eh. Rabadam. With me, daughter, you know. When we say a little prayer, Demaram.